For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and socially. In the midst of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other than human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationships to the lands where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, and welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. This podcast is produced and made possible from supporters on Patreon. Thank you. If the Rewilding Podcast inspires you, gives you hope, or makes you think, please subscribe, share it on social media, and become a patron at patreon.com slash Peter Michael Bauer. Permaculture is a design science for creating regenerative landscapes. In rewilding, we often perceive it as a kind of technology based on ancient hunter-gatherer horticultural subsistence strategies from around the world. While there are many valuable criticisms of permaculture, just as there are of rewilding, it's still one of the most effective tools for creating alternative subsistence strategies to the extractive ones that dominate our world today. To understand how far we've come, we need to listen to the elders of the movement and hear all they have endured and accomplished to get us where we are today. Hazel is one such elder for me and the rewilding community. Hazel began gardening around the age of five. They earned degrees in forestry and systemic botany, systematic botany from Syracuse University and SUNY College of Forestry in 1969. Hazel taught wild edible plants and woods lore at Laney College in Oakland, California in the early 70s and helped Bill Mollison teach the first permaculture design course at Evergreen State College in 1982, which by the way, was the year I was born. Hazel has taught various permaculture courses ever since becoming a notorious teacher and proponent of social forestry. I first met Hazel in 2009 during my permaculture design course with Toby Hemingway. Hazel was the only guest teacher in the class who seemed to share my vision of a rewilded future. And I knew that I needed to go learn from them directly. I took their social forestry class in 2015 and then came back as a guest teacher the following year. I've since continued to practice various forms of social forestry while sending many people their way. Land tending is an integral part of rewilding and social forestry is an inspiring model for us to use. Hazel has finally finished their book on social forestry and you can pre-order it now um, or order it if you're listening to this after it's out. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to get the world word out and have you on the podcast. Hazel, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Bit of an expedition today, but... <laughs> yeah, tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a, a late winter snow um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's spectacular. Mm. There was like a foot and a half of snow in the Siskiyous above 2,000 feet. Amazing. And uh, yesterday I had to climb on my roof and clear off the gear in order to uh, communicate. <laughs> so here I am at the main farmhouse on awesome. the ranch, on the Wolf Gulch Ranch, mm. and uh, ready to have an adventure on <laughs> Zoom. Yeah. So, cool. Well, thanks for trekking through the snow all that way to get to yeah. this. <laughs> um, yeah, I just thought it would be cool if I love um your stories that you're an amazing storyteller and so i thought it would be fun to kind of start out with you just telling me a story about your childhood and maybe specifically something that you remember fundamentally shaping your perception of the world <laughs> so one of my earliest memories and i must have been two or three years old actually is on my hands and knees in the gutter next to my grandmother's house where the coal was hand shoveled down a chute into the basement. And there in the gutter where the rain had fallen were pieces of coal. And I was fascinated. It was jet black, smooth and full of rainbows. There was all mm. this color. And I didn't realize at the time that I was looking at the essence of the planet, of life on the planet, petrified life. I had no idea. Mm. And, but that memory is so strong mm. of holding this piece of coal and looking at it. So that's 
that's amazing, <laughs> right? I mean, it's as if I got chosen or mm. something. Hey, mm. you. And the other story I want to tell is my mother liked to take us to graveyards for picnics. Well, in Washington County, there are hundreds of graveyards, most of which have ancestors of mine in them. And um, and these were great. People didn't go there. They were full of wildness. The surroundings of the ancient tombstones, my people have been there in Washington County for 400 years, was butterflies and birds and native forest and so it was sort of like the temple grand grounds in Sri Lanka, the last little, but of course, upstate New York was pretty wild then. So we had lots of fun, mm. chasing butterflies, identifying wildflowers, uh, hide and seek between the gravestones. And I didn't know what my mother was up to, but I kind of understand it now. We're going to go visit the ancestors. Mm. We're going to go have a picnic in the graveyard. So that was a big connection, mm. wildness for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, how did your, it's interesting that you said coal and the, this experience of seeing coal, because it makes me think of like, you know, making charcoal. I know it's different than coal, but, um, you know. Has rainbows. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So do you see like a connection there in any way, like in, you like becoming, you know, making charcoal and stuff later on in life. This wasn't in the list of questions. No, um, <laughs> um, I do now looking back because mm -hmm. I'm fascinated as a with carbon budgeting mm -hmm. and how important it is to put that fossil back in the mm -hmm. ground mm -hmm. and to honor it there. It's our ancestor. Mm -hmm. This black stuff. It does wonderful stuff if it's in the ground mm. and especially charcoal when, you know, once charcoal is charcoal until it gets charged with life and then it becomes biochar and then it does amazing things, mm. helps the forest, helps the soils recover. So there is, a, there is a storyline there. Mm. So yeah. Awesome. Good question. Um, yeah. So another thing is, I just often think about like, I'm, I just turned 40 last year and, you know, there was like a sense of urgency through most of my youth. And I've got to a point now where I've been able to see a lot of transformation of as an adult. And I see oftentimes younger people who have a deeper sense of urgency and are criticizing the work I do for like it not being enough. Oftentimes they don't understand how far how much I've accomplished in, in particular things or how much, you know, the, the movement has accomplished in particular ways. And I see that now, especially looking at my elders who I criticized when I was younger <laughs> for not, you know, this, this isn't enough or this isn't a thing, but there's like a scope at this point, I'm sort of in that middle age now, right. Where I can kind of see forward and backward. And I'm having that realization of like, Oh crap, you know, like where were things when you were young and how have they changed in positive ways? Because I think it's easy to like lose track of that when you're, when you're always trying to create something, a better way to li uh, live, you know, it's hard to see how far we've come in certain ways. And I think, um, you know, talking to somebody that is an elder has a deeper perspective on how far we've come in certain ways. And so I'm curious if you want to, um, touch on that at all in particular maybe specifically about permaculture like what was you know in terms of regenerative subs regenerative subsistence practices like what existed before permaculture and how has it come along in so many years to become this big thing and how much has it changed i mean there's a lot of criticism for it which is one of the other reasons why i'm like come on we need to like appreciate it still even if we have critiques you know because of how far we've come and so yeah anyway what's your perspective on that <laughs> <laughs> a very long one <laughs> yeah. um and thanks to my mom and my culture and stories that i picked up um it turns out that um many cultures that have been forced to move have held on to their traditional ecological knowledge through a narrative through a thread and at this point permaculture is like a boot camp 
it's like a download. It's like you go there to get your uh, stripes, you know, and get going. But it also is a design field. So it thinks it can make things up. It can like rearrange things. But I have quite a different perspective because my ancestors were very close to the land and were organic farmers and were dealing with indigenous First Nations way, way back, 400 years back and continuously. So my grandfather, Ted Fish, was an organic farmer and he had an organic garden. I remember it well because I was gardening so young. And so I have a sense of cultures doing it right that get disrupted. And then there's holding on to a thread during the aggravation of disruption and putting it back together again and later, just by luck. So to, to have this river, this underground stream that still carries the story, to me, it's the greatest blessing. And when permaculture came along, it was like, yeah, I mean, in fact, I went back east and I visited my brother Tim's farm and he had it tricked out. And I went, where'd you learn permaculture? And he just looked at me with that haughty, blunt Quaker attitude and said, you left. Meaning, <laughs> we've been doing this for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. What are you talking mm -hmm. about? Mm -hmm. So I even got called out <laughs> by my siblings, right? Like, what do you know? You don't live here anymore. Mm. But I now have tied those threads into the threads of so many other First Nations, Indigenous people, organic farming traditions. It's all there. There's a there's a tremendously long story. And and just to repeat myself, permaculture is a band-aid. It's like short term. And and there's lots of great stories I can tell about that. But um I once was up on the Pacific Crest, and I happened to be talking to a Modoc, a Native American, and First Nation on his own land. And we had a conversation, and I, I kind of apologized for my ancestors, and he brushed it off. And he basically said, we have an entirely different sense of time. You white people are short timers. Later. It was a little harsh. <laughs> but, um, but you know, he was like, yeah, you know about the Paisley Caves? Perfectly matches the DNA of the Modoc. They've been on this landscape for 15,000 years plus. So what's our perspective? Mm -hmm. How do we get through? We need stories. Mm. We need to make this narrative. And we need to have that narrative in symbolic forms not books etc the 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 quaker phrase is the book it will perish and the steeple will fall but the truth will be there at the end of it all so that's wonderful you know it gives us a sense oh we're part of life we're on this planet humans can actually be useful although we are in the aggravation. We're in really hard times. I have some questions about that. So anyways. Was that yeah, enough? so it's interesting thinking about how, <laughs> you know, the book will perish and you just came out with your book. <laughs> yeah. How do you how do you feel about that project? Um, you know, what was it like writing it and how do you want it to go out in the world? You know. Well, so far, everybody's excited about this book that's coming out that they haven't read yet. So I have kind of a bad anti-attitude about this. <laughs> um, like, what are you guys talking about? Get back to me later. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I'm busy. I'm mm -hmm. still working on the land. Mm -hmm. And so I, to me, the book is a done thing. It's like last year's news. Mm -hmm. I, have, I really am not attached to this. Mm -hmm. I have no idea where it's going. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. I kind of don't know if it exists or not. <laughs> I'm waiting for some feedback. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, what do we do? Where does mm -hmm. it go? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should. I don't think mm -hmm. we, we make things up that's design. 
or we connect things into the big story, mm -hmm. the long story. That's survival. That's moving forward. Mm -hmm. And social forestry is way older than permaculture. Permaculture is a recent thing. So yeah, tell me about that. How where's the origin of social forestry? Um so I guess it goes way, way back, millions of years to humans always being associated with trees, with savannas, and savannas being uh, multiple species, multiple product. So the humans become omnivores, they pick up tools, they start to work with the forest, they learn to use fire. Um, pretty soon they're in social forestry, they're learning, they're getting feedback, they're identifying with the animals that live there besides themselves. We are all animals. And um, and so slowly we start to find a little bit of evidence, but the evidence of digging sticks, hmm. they rot away. The evidence of baskets, bye-bye. The evidence of rope, maybe some clay seals in a cave someplace underground, but weapons of war, uh, hunting tools, uh, uh, knives and butchering tools, they're made out of stone. So we don't have the, the record. We haven't had the record and we have grown up, those of, those of us who are Europeans, displaced Europeans, we've grown up in a um, difficult time of imperialism, destroying local cultures, forgetting our own culture because of trauma, because we as Northern Europeans were removed from social forestry thousand years ago or more. So there's story on top of story on top of story. And I'll, I'll, I love this article. It's in my bibliography. When the Ice Age ended, somehow Hazel showed up in Northern Europe. And quickly afterwards, oaks and ashes and maples. And by the pollen record and by the records, it's like, wait a minute, how did this forest move north so fast? Well, it was called social forestry. Mm -hmm. We knew what we needed to do to move north. We took it with us and we built it with the hazel, number one tree, as far as utility. Hmm. I mean, the, the most implicate tree, the one that is the mythological, ecological understanding of social forestry, that's the white oak. Lots about that, but so yeah, social forestry has very, very deep roots. And in my own life, um, my village still practiced some old um, European social forestry, May baskets, um, cabbage night, children's pilgrimages. What's cabbage night? Um, the night before Halloween, you harvest the unharvested gardens that were abandoned. You basically glean them mm. and you distribute that produce in other places in the village. Um, how shall we say artistically? Um, <laughs> yeah, you make messes. It's Big sort of like of egging, a, egging a house or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we use vegetables. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't it bad as egging? That's funny, cabbage night. I love that. <laughs> cabbage night. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I'm curious how much of your college forestry background influenced how you see social forestry. I mean, I know there's like, you know, sort of the way industrial agriculture or industrial forestry has, you know, done massive clear cuts and replantings of trees, monocultures. And um, I, I mean, it sounds like it's an anti-social forestry of, of us in a sense, right? I'm curious, like where you um, where you saw those things coming together, like with your gardening upbringing uh, through gardening and then learning more about 
you know, having that ancestral thread and then going to forestry school? And where did you, you know, where was the conflict and where was the sort of um, threads that you found that you were able to connect with that type of education and program? Well, I got lucky and landed in uh, the uh, plant taxonomy major, systematic botany. So I had a little corner to hide in at the <laughs> otherwise industrialized mm -hmm. forestry college. But on the other hand, the lab work, the science, the library, um, the dedicated professors, um, I got one hell of an ecological education about how forests work. And in fact, the founder of the Forest Service and the New York State College of Forestry was Pinchot. He was German. And um, he he proved that clear cutting was disastrous. Hmm. He did trials in the Adirondacks. I went and visited some of these trials 60 years later when I was there. And so we were taught this stuff doesn't work. And it's it's like it's like not appropriate ecologically. And we were introduced, I was introduced uh, by Dr. Mar by Dr. Morrison to Sand County Almanac, um, Aldo Leopold, mm -hmm. which is now recognized as a sort of Bible of rewilding. You know, it's like really beautifully written mm -hmm. and makes all these points. If you're going to take an ecosystem apart, you ought to save all the parts because you're not going to be able to put it back together. Mm -hmm. And that was El Eldo Leopold. Mm -hmm. So I got both. I got the really solid science and I got to see where the bureaucracies were taking shortcuts that were deadly, that were like really bad shortcuts. And all for commercialization. Um, and this is, I'm going to go sideways for a moment, but my Hicksite Quaker ancestors in the 1700s saw this all coming. They saw commercialism, they saw industrialism, they saw capitalism, and they said, this isn't going to work. And my, my most famous ancestor, um, Elias Hicks, um, went around quite a bit for a long time debating and saying, no, this is this is not good. And when when it was and then there was a big break in the Quaker community and many of the Quakers um, turned to commercialism. Hmm. And my branch headed for the Adirondacks <laughs> and and settled on these these really harsh foothill farms because we could hold our culture together. Mm -hmm. We could continue our understanding of how the world actually works. And although I don't have all the threads, I think this was largely influenced by our contacts with First Nations. And the really wonderful book around, about that is Shell Game by, oh geez, what's his name? Oh, I'm forgetting it right now. I but, can find it and put it in. Yeah, you can find Shell Game. Um, uh, First Nations offered refugees who were in horrible shape from Northern Europe welcome and said, this is how things work here. And the Europeans said no and took everything. So there's a really big story there. But luckily, mm -hmm. I'm a carrier. I'm this white person who has a story about how, oh no, we understood this was going to be a problem. And I'm here saying, it ain't over yet. Let's not forget our lessons. And I thank my ancestors for having done a really good assessment of a big mess headed all of our way. Mm. And now here we are. <laughs> yeah. Um. To me, social forestry and rewilding are sort of interchangeable in, in a sense, um, and I think to some extent permaculture too. If if there's a uh, if there's a critique of contemporary society or the dominant society and capitalism and civilization in these larger systems, um, if you can have that critique and use those tools to you know find a a resilient relationship. But I'm curious specifically how you 
sort of see social forestry maybe both applying to conservation rewilding as well as human rewilding because you know there's kind of those two branches of the term and so i'm i'm curious like you know is there potential for maybe uh, a marriage to you know of a, in a sense of the conservation form of rewilding and human rewilding with a concept like social forestry um so i have a trope if you wish of quick fix retrofit and ultimate i've borrowed that by the way for my rewilding yeah, 101 <laughs> I, I, didn't I always give you credit <laughs> okay great um <laughs> And um, right now, I think we're in triage mm -hmm. and triage of civilization, triage of wildness. So that's the conservation thing mm -hmm. is, oh, my God, we need to do this emergency triage on wildness. Well, that's short sighted because we need to really be thinking about retrofit. And that's where social forestry comes in. And then ultimate is visionary and oh my gosh we need that story we can't move forward without this visionary story which can be both backcasting and forecasting it's still ultimate because it's like well if we really had our act together what would we be doing and i can think of lots of ways to do to tell that story i can think of plays, music. Uh, I believe that kind of ultimate vision is woven into almost all cultures on the planet. It's there. It's in, it's in patterns. It's in clothing. It's in stories. It's in the, it's in the displacements. It's in the trauma. It's there. And so the ultimate is the most difficult because people are in triage. Mm -hmm. So my joke is, well, when it comes to rewilding, social forestry is uh, something we can do right now. Might as well. Mm -hmm. But it does require some thinking and planning. Therefore, it's retrofit. Mm -hmm. But let's be careful. Let's not freak out as we are in triage. Mm -hmm. So there are rules around triage and... Um, meanwhile, we need to come together and cooperate. Awesome. Um, in, in thinking about storytelling and, and sort of a bigger hopeful vision, um, I wrote down this note to ask you to sort of riff on this, uh, <laughs> this idea. It's 50 years from now, a teenager wakes up in the morning what is their day like living in a social forestry community? Well, what? He stayed up till 2 a.m. again, drumming, singing, and now he's like stumbling out of bed because he's 16 or 17 years old. I guess it's a he in this case. And, um, and where does he go? Well, there's only one place where anything is happening in the hamlet, and that's the communal kitchen. So he kind of like staggers down to the communal kitchen and, and scrapes together some food, which has been left out because of teenagers. And then he's hanging out in the kitchen. Well, anything can happen from there. Somebody comes into the kitchen because that's where you want to go. If you want to find out, make any connections, you got to be in the kitchen. Pretty soon this kid has been drafted and has a marvelous adventure for the rest of the day. Because there's something to do. There's always something to do. And once they've woken up and they've had a cup of the uh, twig tea and, um, and some um, fried uh, turkey tail mushrooms, um, then they uh, are ready and buy gum. There's something to do. So, that's my <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, the The concept of social forestry is so all encompassing. Um, 
Is there, and I, you know, I've been to your class twice, once as a student, once as a guest instructor. However, it was more like just being there as a student again. <laughs> and, you know, both times were like so uniquely different. And in each one, there was like different stuff that was said that alluded to even deeper avenues or areas to explore. And so, you know, when I knew that you were writing this book, I was like, oh, this is going to be great because here's going to be a, a, a resource mm -hmm. for a lot of this stuff, right? Like, I mean, I took lots of notes those two different times, but essentially I feel like a book is a collection of notes from a class, right? And at the same time, I was like, just one book, like, <laughs> you know, like, is this not a, is this not volume one of a series, you know? And so I guess my question is, um, because it's so all encompassing, is there anything that you've, that you have to, that you had to leave out, you know, um, that you're like, mm, you know, uh, volume two is going to focus on this thing or, or, you know, like what, what are you, are you able to touch on as much as you could in the book? And, and so, yeah, what is the, what is the things you wish you could have gone deeper into or, or things that you had to leave out? Um, so I've read at least a dozen books since, um, the manuscript was locked down through the editing process. Um, and these books haven't made it, did not make it into the bibliography, although mm. they might have made it into my annual storytelling. Mm. Um, so I continue to think, but most of the books I've read recently are confirming what I said in the social forestry book. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that book was a was a, a a template that we can hang and and uh Peter Bain said the bibliography alone is worth the uh, cost of admission or something like that. So mm, mm, um that's awesome. <laughs> so start with building your library, your community library. There's a lot of places you can go. I don't need to tell it all to you. But what we're missing which may be in a different question here. What we're really missing here is skills. I'm hearing this over and mm -hmm. over. And young people coming to the course have less and less ability mm -hmm. with hand tools, with, with, uh, with basic use of rope, with, with basic repair, um, handling of cloth and leather and wood. And so... There's really a big reskilling involved in rewilding, strangely. <laughs> right? Because you would think, oh, wild. Oh, we don't need anything. No, we need the right thing that fits with wildness. Because the big thing about wildness is uh, complications are not enough to deal with complexity. Complexity, reality, nature is way beyond humans. I mean, we're stupid. We are, we're just beginning to start to understand it. And then only by reference, only by tonal qualities, only by dancing, only by knowledge. Knowledge is so big and so multidimensional. I mean, so where do we go? I think I think people can come into their wildness and their bodies through crafts. And thus I really like that book Craft by uh, Alexander Langland. Mm. Um, so this is where we should all be going is local craft groups, learning to deal with tools, learning to make tools and learning to, replace consumerism like okay there's all these science fiction scenarios where we've got warehouses full of polyester clothes that'll last us forever <laughs> um but no that's not exactly true uh there's so much to learn to come into balance again and get back to the work the work of rewilding is back to your question conservation social forestry, and then horticulture, mm -hmm. you know, the actual skills of feeding ourselves. So those three things are a Venn diagram and they're, 
mm. now on the cover of all the social forestry mm. uh, horse books. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything else that you that you like feel you need to to say in regard to social forestry before I say what are what questions do you have for me? <laughs> ah, well, <laughs> the questions I have for you is is sort of um don't think that wildness is out there someplace else. Wildness is right where you are. And that that's a big challenge. And many people think, but urban areas, well, in the Pacific Northwest, all the urban areas I ever worked in are full of wildness. Mm -hmm. And if you'll excuse me, from a manipulative point of view, that's untended wildness. Mm -hmm. So how can we, through tending, come into an understanding of wildness so that our actions are in harmony and are actually useful? Because I'll keep repeating, I believe humans can be very helpful, mm. very useful, and have been before. <laughs> so I'm not quite ready to get rid of humans, but mm -hmm. I'd like to reorient them, whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> awesome. So that's why I have these questions for you. Mm -hmm. so I, I'm going to read off your question for me, your first one, which is what <laughs> yeah. is happening up on the two big rivers? So the Willamette and the Columbia. Um, yeah, there's a lot happening here. Um, Rewild Portland is, you know, the the core thing that we've been, that I've been doing for over 10 years now. And um, like you're saying, these urban environments, they, and from my perspective, you know, I was born here, my, my grandparents and great grandparents and great, great grandparents are all buried in the cemeteries in Portland. I'm a, I'm a fifth generation, uh, Northeast Portlander. Um, and so I have like a deep connection to this place. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to die in the city, <laughs> you know, so I'm going to go out. Um, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to try to make it as biodiverse as possible through social forestry. And we've been thinking a lot about um, you know, the, the permaculture notion of food forests, right? And so there's lots of people here that are more interested in that uh, than the ever, really. And so um, I think there's going to be a big push for edible social forestry. And, you know, I've told this to other people before. I have this idea. I was walking through Oaks Bottom Natural Wildlife Refuge, which, by the way, was a garbage dump in the 70s that they were going to turn into a motorcycle racetrack. <laughs> and... Uh, and the neighborhood was like, no, we want this to be a nature preserve. So they just started putting up signs that said Oaks Bottom Nature Preserve. Um, well, uh, you know, I'm very thankful that they took that they did that. They basically squatted the property, the neighborhood, and blocked it from development. Uh, nowadays, they probably just would have been hauled out of there and it would have gotten developed. I don't know. Um, we'll see <laughs> if there's more of this kind of stuff happening in the future. But I was walking down the trail. And I was picking the lemon bomb that was growing on the trail and snacking on it. And coming the opposite direction was the city of Portland spraying it with glyphosate dyed with blue, you know, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, like what an opportunity to do urban social forestry. What if like this crew that's out here, what if instead of spraying this, they had just put a notice to the neighborhood, hey, it's time to harvest lemon balm, come and make medicine and tea and remove this species. And so the neighborhood would have been, the people who live there would have been engaged with their place in those spaces, tending them, making medicine together, being in nature together. And then there's no problem. It's it's all just wrapped into one, right? And so I'm, I'm trying to rethink how Rewild Portland not necessarily um, could create an infrastructure for this, but be a catalyst for this kind of infrastructure, if you if, if I even want to call it that. So that's one of the things that, um, you know, is, is sort of always in the back of my mind is like how to, especially with invasives, you know, we do a lot of work with invasive species and, and tending those, those, um, you know, into baskets and medicine and food and all of those different things. I, I was there at Oak Bottom when that was first. Oh, really? <laughs> with Toby. 
because Toby lived in that neighborhood or something. Oh, or, okay. Right. And he took me down there. Uh, what was what is that? Selway. And um, and I was really excited because I could tell by that that floods. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. development's unlikely and with sea rise. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but uh, miraculously, there was all this beaver work mm. that showed me how deep it mm. flooded. Mm -hmm. right because because it wasn't beaver work down at the ground it was beaver mm -hmm. work six foot up in the air where they could just float there and mm -hmm. chow yeah well so, i mean that was that rewilding was wonderful mm -hmm. that was to, to see that early mm -hmm. on and there were not undeveloped trails and but yeah a damaged lands mm -hmm. you know where are we going yeah there's a canvas so we'll patch there now actually and they're they're uh They've been working with First Nations and they have a camas patch, oh. but it's oh. still a thing where that's one part of it and they're spraying the rest of it and it's all interconnected. So anyway, there's okay. bits and pieces. Number two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are there, question number two was, are there any watershed council shadow governments? Can you explain to me what that means? <laughs> yeah. Um. So at this point we have... Uh, um political boundaries that are senseless that do not represent mm -hmm. um um ecological patterns mm. so uh decades ago the oregon governor promoted watershed councils and these watershed councils gathered together lots of mapping and I imagine there are all these defunct watershed councils in Oregon with closets full of mapping, mm. full of information. So if we come into um, understanding where we are through a watershed council concept, then we start to understand where the opportunities are and how to connect things together. And then that council can suggest to the, to the um, political entities, the modern political entities, more intelligent ways to operate, more ecological ways to operate, and would be more careful about it. So uh, shadow governments in history have a bad name because um, certain reactionary groups use them. But the model is the government that's meeting downtown is passing legislation and the watershed council is going, no, how about this? So you, you present alternative legislation and you present it at every scale, but always centered on understanding where you are. And, and by the way, in most of the world, a watershed is the ridgeline. And so these should be drainage basin councils, mm, actually. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the first things to do, which includes the children, is called a watershed pilgrimage. Walk the boundaries mm. of the micro catchment that you actually live in. Can you find those boundaries? what streets would get you closest to it? Mm. Can we do this every year? Can we just start this as a thing? The children's watershed pilgrimage with stories along the way. Mm. Then we would know where we were mm -hmm. a little better. And then eventually we might be able to make some useful suggestions. So. Awesome. Yeah, I think... There's definitely some pretty cool watershed councils in this area. I don't know how much the city government listens to any of them at all at this moment. You know, Portland is going through a whole upheaval in terms of our government structure is going to completely change in the next two years because um, it's an archaic one that is no longer like, you know, for a city our size, it's considered archaic and unmanageable at the level that we're at. And so finally we voted two years ago or a year ago or so to completely revolutionize the um, the way our government is structured. 
So it'll be interesting to see how that happens because I do think the way that we're doing it, like, I don't know if you're familiar with um, instant runoff voting, mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the things that instead of having like the bureaus um, managed by the city commissioners, now all they're gonna all of the bureaus are gonna be managed individually. Um, there's going to be like 12 positions and all of them are going to be elected by instant runoff voting. <laughs> they did this whole overhaul. And so it's going to be, and it's completely different than what we've had. So there's a lot of potential for exactly what you're saying for, to have individual neighborhoods. It's, it's more decentralized than it was before. Um, we'll probably see commissioners that don't live on the West side, <laughs> which is the wealthy side of Portland, um, which is very rare. I think Chloe, uh, you know, uh, one of our former commissioners, she was like the only one that was ever a renter. Everybody before her had been a landholding homeowner. Uh, anyway, just interesting stuff like that's kind of going on right now. And it'll be interesting to see how those kinds of things can take shape. And I'm hoping that we can really get in and um, in particular work with the parks department on ceasing the use of herbicides to the level or at all that they use them today and also doing more of the kind of social forestry stuff um, per the suggestions of people like that are on the watershed councils. Yeah. So um, there's some stuff and who knows what's happening. You know, I think <laughs> a rewild Portland's not a shadow government in that sense, but we're trying to be a, a bigger co community and cultural influence on um, definitely the policy of Portland without actually, we're not a, we're not the kind of nonprofit that can do politicking in that particular way we can't do um legislation and stuff like that um but what we can do is is encourage a vision transformation and so i think that's what mostly our, our goal is okay third question that that last <laughs> that last comment you made about nonprofits being restricted in their political activities is an important one mm -hmm. so i mean okay. we could have been structured that way but we're not so Right. Um, and we could divide and become two different entities. One that oh, yeah. could be doing. Yeah. yeah but yeah. anyway, that, that's all. I, I don't think we're going to go right. that way, but, but we might, don't, you know, don't you work know. yourself into a dither. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Number yeah. three. Okay. The third question was how much abandoned commercial property is located near riparian and brownfield urban forests? This is awesome because um, right now, Rewild Portland, we're located in this really cool um, it's sort of a maker's community called Green Anchors, like a ship's anchor, but it's a play off Green Acres. Um, yeah. And because uh, it's an old shipyard that's been converted into um, really a, a, a maker's space for small scale, small scale sustainable businesses. So you've got like uh, like a tiny little solar panel company there, um, like four different tiny house companies, a beekeeper with over a million bees. He has OHSU or sorry, not OHSU, OSU come out and study his bees um, for, you know, the, the um, bee die offs and things like that. Um, there's like a woodworker, a metal worker. We have a greenhouse there now. It's like a hundred feet by 30 feet. We're growing dye plants and, um, you know, perennial food and, you know, just all kinds of stuff. Uh, fiber plant, a lot of fiber plants. Um, and then there's also like a nursery where we've just been building up soil on top of the sealed asphalt. Uh, but it's in a riparian zone and it's, um, it's, a f I mean, it's still a commercial property that was essentially abandoned. And the guys who took it over, they just were trying to find a place. They, they got this business model where they were going to, they got a tugboat, they're like boat people. And they were just going to haul logs out of the river and mill them for a living, just stray logs. And, uh, so they needed a place to mill the logs. So they bought a portable mill and then, um, got this tugboat and then, Green Anchors, it wasn't called that back then, um, was the space that they found. And they found out that their model wasn't going to be really sustainable the way they thought it was. So they started subleasing the property to all these different makers and green businesses and stuff. Um, and so it's kind of uh, expanded from that. But like just north of us is this lot. It's owned by the Port of Portland. It's seven acres. And it's the same. It's again, it's like an abandoned lot. It used to be a maybe a, just north of that is like a parking lot for Toyotas when they come off the boat. So it's like massive asphalt, but both of these properties are side by side and they butt against a property that's called the Baltimore Woods Project, which is the last oak savanna stretch in the Portland area. And it's along a ridge line that could never really be developed. 
And so they're converting that into a natural space. And then we are sort of right next to that with the railroad tracks in between. But this undeveloped uh, area north of us, that's the same size, essentially around seven acres. Um, it's owned by the Port of Portland. And they were recently trying to lease it to Verizon, a hundred year lease to Verizon Mobile to do military drone testing on site. <laughs> and so, of course, you know, that was just never going to fly in Portland. I don't even know why they tried to do that. But the neighborhood was like, no, um, you know, Autobahn Society was like, there are birds like the drones are going to disrupt the birds from Forest Park, which is literally on the other side of the river from us. So we're like entrenched in this really interesting spot. That's like a mix of, you know, quote unquote, wild, untended forest, urban, industrial, river, riparian forest park, you know, it's this sort of interesting jumble of stuff. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, it's been exciting. We've been trying to, um, they were trying to get us to move in there for like maybe five years before we finally did a couple of years back. Um, and now they actually purchased the property from the landowner and uh, we're going to start doing some major riparian restoration, um, removing all of the old, uh, you know, dock that from the, when it was a shipyard, there's like huge logs that are, who knows how deep they are. Um, they've got these massive cranes. Now we're going to be pulling those out and, and trying to make some like salmon habitat and all kinds of stuff over there. What a great report. Exactly what I was hoping for. Mm. Um, I think that we're going to have more and more abandoned commercial uh, properties because a lot was overbuilt and no longer useful. And um, and many of them are down by the river or on places that shouldn't have been built on. Or mm -hmm. so that's exciting. Thank you for that report. Yeah, Thanks. you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few you know exciting projects happening around town here, and um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty hopeful for the way things are at the moment. <laughs> All right, cool. rewilding and social forestry so moving forwards. <laughs> yeah. Um, so your book is coming out at the end of April, April on Earth Day. Apparently. Um, and we have apparently we will have links to all of that stuff in the show notes. Is there any um, other things you wanted to say before we wrap it up? Last bits of wisdom. Oh, yeah. Last bits of wisdom. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, listen to the keynote I gave for Rewilding <laughs> a half ago. Yeah. That'll awesome. get you oriented. Um, but yeah, otherwise, this has been a great conversation. Cool. Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Rewilding Podcast. Check out the show notes to connect with my guest and for a list of resources that we mentioned during the conversation. If this episode inspired you, made you think more deeply, or gave you some new tools to use, make sure to subscribe and become a patron at patreon.com slash Peter Michael Bauer. Thanks a lot.